welcome to all my panelists uh, for this very special session. Truth is Caricature, uh, a very interesting title for this session, especially in the times that we live in. And uh, kudos to the four of you who have been able to create your space uh, uh, in what seems to be increasingly tough times for journalis uh, journalism at large and definitely uh, cartoon, uh, cartoon or comic journalism, as it's called, and the various facets that you bring out. I'm going to start with Manjul. Uh, because we're talking about the crackdown uh, on media and especially the kind of work that all four of you do. Manjul, you particularly have seen this crackdown. You got a government notice for, for the kind of content that you put out on your Twitter handle. Um, given your body of work, given that you have been working for decades now with some of the top publications in the country, uh, were you surprised by this kind of crackdown? Hi. Hi, hi everybody. So... Uh, down part was always there. Like, I, I seriously doubt that any regime, since I have been working, was favorable to the cartoonists. But uh, uh, in the recent past, I think that it is, it is kind of crossed all limits. Uh, as you asked me that uh, whether I was shocked, I was, I was shocked when I got that notice. And I I said this that time also during that period, and made me very angry also, because uh, I've been working for so long I never got any uh, any such notice from anybody, even from my editors also. They never uh, uh, said that this cartoon is. Uh, uh, this cartoon is crossing the limits or legal limits or something like that. So uh, one fine morning you get a notice which doesn't say that what is what is it note what this notice is about, and vaguely hints you that uh, somebody in the enforce uh, law enforcement agency is uh, not happy with your work. So it was disturbing and uh, obviously I was angry that time. But uh, does that stop you from doing what you do? And how much of a pressure does it put on you? Because now somewhere at the back of your head, you're constantly thinking that this might upset uh, the, the powers that be or, or does it make you more empowered? Has it strengthened you and given you more courage? Uh, See, uh, when you draw a cartoon, when the cartoonist draws his cartoon, I doubt that he is thinking about all these pressure and everything. He just draws the, if he gets a good idea, he draws it. Okay, he is not caring about who, who is going to say what. It only after the cartoon gets published, <laughs> the yeah. repercussions start. Okay, so, uh, I am working like I, have, I was working earlier. There is no change in my routine or my mindset or anything. Uh, because, see, when I joined this career, like some 30 years ago, it was very clear that not all people will be happy with my work all the time. This was very clear. I was very clear in that sense. Uh -huh. But like I said, that uh, uh, this regime, particularly, they they have crossed all the limits. Like for everything, they see the thing is a person who says that he is running the country. He works for it, like he works eighteen hours a day. He doesn't take hol uh, holidays or he doesn't go on holidays. He doesn't take leave. Okay, he is working day and night for the. Uh, for the betterment of the country. Okay. Now, if there is a there is a very small announcement, say that the exams are being postponed or cancelled, he comes on TV, announces himself. Okay. It's a major thing is happening. He comes on TV. You'd never see any other minister saying anything. So the whole uh, uh, is working under his name. Now suddenly one day you get a message saying that you are not supposed to draw that person. You just cannot draw him. Okay. Mm. Otherwise, 
otherwise the publication is not going to carry your cut okay and this is across publications you will find very few publications who are still courageous enough to carry cartoons on that person so that clearly shows i have never seen such a thing in my like 30 years career never no and never seen. we also have uh, rachita taneja who has uh, contempt proceedings against her a legal case against her for again drawing two cartoons rachita i know you can't talk about the the matter because it's in court uh, but i want to understand as a cartoonist because i still see your work and i see the adventures of dr modi and several others that you do on your feminist uh, um, uh, you know uh, comic website called sanitary panels uh, so i'm asking the same question again does this empower you what keeps you going on a daily basis it's very hard to find humor when you have a case against you yeah thanks maruk uh, i i agree it's uh, what with what manjul ji said uh, basically drawing the cartoon itself like on my ipad is one thing and then publishing it is a whole other thing right so i do have cartoons that are unpublished that i am going to publish in the future uh, yeah there is a clear um there's there's a clear need to censor voices of dissent by this government and that's been happening through trolling through abuse through threats of physical violence through threats of uh, legal um intervention and so there is a very concerted effort and i think it's doubled down um since the lockdown as well and it could just be me thinking this but uh, uh, you know naomi klein has this concept called shock doctrine which is where while everyone is distracted and taking uh, care of themselves and and having to scramble to just survive the government starts pushing in regressive policy um and starts clamping down on dissent uh, because people just don't have the capacity to fight every battle while they're you know trying to survive on a daily basis so i think the government has really uh, taken a pandemic in that way for its own pr and to make sure that uh, pushed and to push through regressive policy so i i think coming coming back to the question um there is you know there is a constant question of what would it mean to publish this comic uh, but i think stopping but i think because every time the government uh, clamps down on a comic or a, a you know on a cartoonist like manjul ji or um several other i think satish ji also had a take down notice i think it gets more people to start making comics i've seen i've seen more and more people share my comic um, and i've seen more and more uh, people start to make their own comics and share them with me and say hey what do you think about this so i think there is also a flip side to it uh, that more people feel like it's their duty to start uh, creating um, you know more interesting we have uh, sumit kumar also who who's a cartoonist who has his own website uh, called bakar max and the injustice league very interesting stuff strong social commentary sumit as somebody living in the same ecosystem uh, how does this impact you uh, uh to be honest uh, you know my my world and my medium is slightly different because it's not as reactive because my work usually i don't draw anything which is less than 5 pages so you know it's my output time from when i get an idea you know when an injustice happen and by the time i'm finished with my comic the injustice is long gone so uh, what i work now in politics is usually political history mm-hmm. right and in that i mostly what i've done is i've done usually no holds uh, bard approach uh, where whatever i wanted to make i have made mm-hmm. and because it's maybe history right and it was not current government that's why maybe i haven't faced as much flack right uh but on the other hand i have uh, we have made a lot of you know commentary on current uh, uh, prime minister modi and you know uh, even the president itself and uh, till now nothing major has happened but at a personal level i think it's a and it might sound you know slightly stupid but i feel it there are pros and cons of every profession and you know our profession i feel like we literally make cartoons out of people <laughs> and especially people with power so you know they will get pissed off right obviously in an ideal world they should not 
and uh, it's sad that we have to face lack of that but on the other hand like i have seen normal people get angry right so mm. that happens yeah. and i want to i want to bring ellery in at this point ellery hearing all this right uh, what is your reaction do you find it bizarre that there's such strong government action and a crackdown on people who are just trying to put out a cartoon have you seen something similar in australia no i mean it's different it's a different media landscape and there's different yeah. expectations of what you're able to put out or what you're able to do but you know I, I work in the united states and australia and i would say that the um the pressures are less censorship from the government and more censorship from the media outlets that are the gatekeepers for like the larger publications mm -hmm. i mean you definitely see um you know even in the trump era in um in the united states i work with a cartoonist sometimes called rob rogers who was a cartoonist at a pittsburgh based paper and he lost his job because the paper got a new owner and the owner was very pro-Trump and did not like his cartoons. Um, and that's ended up working out okay for Rob because he got a lot of attention for it and that sort of thing. But it's a, and is able to build a membership. He has, thanks to the the era that we live in now, which is, you know, there's so social a fan base can actually support you financially in a way that I think was very difficult earlier on. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the, um, that crowdfunding for um, support is really different. Um, so Rob's okay, he's fine. But in a different world, it wouldn't have worked out well for him because he would have just lost his job. Um, and I think that there's much more, the type of censorship that happens um, more frequently when you have those capitalistic pressures, uh, more self-censorship where you're like, well, I'm not gonna put this together because it won't get published. It won't get past the editors and then I'll lose my job. And that's a totally different experience, obviously, than having, you know, the concerns of being sued and things like that. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, uh, I think that everyone, um, I, I really am interested in hearing about how there's a reaction to um, to those sorts of pressures where you have more people producing cartoons or putting out art because I, I feel I've seen that in many different parts of the world that I've, I've worked with cartoonists from everywhere um, and uh, certainly cartoonists that I've spoken to in the Middle East have often spoken of when there is more like political pressure people will often be like producing more work in response to that because it's uh, important to to respond to those types of pressure with art. Interesting. I'm going to come back to your particular uh, style of storytelling through, uh, especially I was I was uh, reading your report and missing the seven part series and it was fascinating to see how you've told the story. But I want to ask a question of all the four panelists. And this is that cartoons can get controversial. I mean, we're seeing enough examples here of how they do. Um, we know what happened with something like Charlie Hebdo. Where do you as cartoonists, and this is going to open for all four of you, where do you uh, look at religious sensibilities and where do you as cartoonists draw the line? And let me start with you, Ellery. <laughs> Bring the line. Um, well, I mean, I think that for me personally, um, you know, I, the type of comics I work on are more comics journalism, so a little bit more in line with what Sumit, the type of stuff that Sumit's talking about doing, which is like, you know, a longer form piece that it takes a while to produce. Um, and I was, uh, I was asked recently about violence and sex in comics and how like, you know, there's a, you know, that, that's what a lot of people think of when they think of like longer comic books is like particularly violent material. Um, mm. And I don't think that that's something that, um, the, the publications I've worked for have shied away from necessarily, except to say that you, you're more doing, uh, um, the type of work is more uh, subtle than that. It's like you can engage with, um, you know, acts of violence or engage with, you know, things that are taking place without actually depicting that type of work. Um, mm. And I think that sometimes um, it's more clever for an artist to be uh, stepping around that sort of thing and showing things in allegory or in metaphors um, in a way that is not direct uh, than you can in other, if, if you, in, do you, does that make sense? Sorry. <laughs> like, it does, know. does, absolutely does. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so for me, I feel like the line in terms of censorship is, is there is no line for me really when it comes to the type of work that if I wanted to engage on a particular issue, my editor is not going to tell me that I, you know, would not be allowed to do that, but it would be more about how's the framing for that going to work and how are you going to reach a broad audience with that and how would we, you, you know, like the different ways that you might draw out a particular issue because we're pretty socially justice focused. Um, mm -hmm. 
you do a lot of work around police violence in the United States and around like environmental racism and destruction, those sorts of things. And, and if you're tackling subjects like that, you really do need to, um, to be nuanced in the way that you are telling the story and the types of um, uh, imagery that you're, com you're, you're using alongside those, those stories. Okay, Manjul, uh, what about you? Given, given the scenario in India and especially how sensitive we are when it comes to religion, I think uh, it starts uh, with your the kind of upbringing you have, like the kind of atmosphere you see around you. Hmm. It starts from there. Hmm. Like, suppose now I'm seeing that if, I, if I'm laughing at somebody, my parents are telling me that please don't laugh at, at this situation. Okay. So that thing starts from there. When you grow up, you suppose you become a professional cartoonist. Okay. So your editors tell uh, you certain things. Like when I started, some of the editors told me, please don't draw a cartoon about the president. Because an Indian president, he doesn't do anything. He or she. Okay. <laughs> okay. So basically, don't bring him or her into controversy. Okay. That I'm telling you about 1989. Okay. I was pretty young and, but when you see after 15, 16 years, or they told me don't draw uh, judges. Okay. So there are certain things which were like, which were uh, holy cows. Like they were told very clearly that please don't draw these things. Mm. Okay. But when you saw a president like uh, Pratibha Patel, okay. Or earlier when some cartoonists saw a president like uh, during the emergency period. Okay. So then you cannot resist yourself from drawing that particular person. Or when you saw justice, justice you just can't think, okay, we, we should not uh, talk about judges or we should not talk about Supreme Court. We should not draw this. We should not. So basically these are, these are mota moti rules. These are like mm. rules, but Every person draws his or her boundary for himself or herself. Like uh, the, my boundaries cannot suit to Rachita or to Sumit or to somebody else. Okay. It, it is basically, it depends upon your individual sensibilities, how you want to say things. Now, okay. now if you look at Shankar's cartoon, Mm. Shankar always used to say that treat politicians very gently because they are also humans. Okay. And we saw in 2008, a very simple cartoon of Shankar, which he drew some 60 years ago, became so controversial. Uh, they, in, in fact, they said that remove it from the textbooks mm. and not only remove this cartoon, Remove other cartoons of text. Okay. So I think that cart see the cartoon was same, which was drawn that time when Ambedkar was there. But after 60 years, the followers are followers of Ambedkar's, they got agitated about something which was not there in the cart. Not, what, not at all. What about so, you? Yes. Please, please ask. Yes. Sumit, what about you? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, on Manjul sir saying that the president is useless, I completely concur. <laughs> <laughs> and why I'm saying that is because, uh, you know, we, uh, we're now earlier, I was, you know, working as an individual. Now we're a small studio, right? And, uh, that once that happens, then, you know, there's another thing where, you know, the thing also depends that, you know, salaries are to be paid right other than my own and uh, why also i laughed that badly at the president thing also because when right now developing an animated show uh, an animated show for grown ups which makes fun of the indian president and how it's useless so he <laughs> has a, there's a fictional indian president in the story and is absolutely useless and that's where you know uh, the point is that you know nobody's going to buy that show we already know that right we have to actually put our own money to make it but uh, 
what i believe is and what uh, 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 you know uh, what manjul uh, sir also said is that everybody has their own line right and why are their own line like for example charlie hebdo that's their sense of humor if they start doing softy little things right about horses flying and anything else that's not going to work right so everybody we are still artists end of the day right we are slaves to the story right we serve what the story wants us to do right so we are uh, so that way i think everybody has their uh, 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 story uh, uh, you know their own call but one more thing i believe and that is has absolutely nothing to do with politics but about you know when uh, uh, manjul sir said that you know shankar once said that everybody is a human being i think humor and all practitioners of humor uh, would know that you know humor is a very subtle thing you move it one bit up and down and it can become bullying mm. and especially when it comes to the cases of you know punching up and punching down right so and that has happened a lot with me in the past you know with friends and that's where you learn you know where it turns into bullying when it's a joke so that's also a sort of a side to the line right where you draw it rajita yeah just exactly what samit said um for me the rule is never punch down uh, so if there is there is a a complex issue in a minority community that i'm not a part of i am not going to uh, try and you know make a comic on that because it is not my place to i believe that uh, there are artists and there are creators who have uh, skin in the game who and, and who have more lived experience who can more correctly interpret the uh, the reality so i i make it a rule to never punch down and to never uh, try and pretend like i understand issues that do not directly affect me so you know just just right off the bat that's just what i um, stick by Mm -hmm. So I I want to talk about uh, talk to you, Ellery, about the way you have developed comic journalism as the term that I heard. Honestly, being in journalism, I hadn't heard it before. Must be my uh, not knowing enough. But the way you've done the seven part series and told a story through uh, through your cartoons is is not just powerful. It's also very simple. Uh, at various levels and I, i guess the power comes from that simplicity um i want you to talk a bit about that and also how that is uh, uh, like what rachita mentioned earlier there are different manifestations of uh, cartoons uh, today i mean with so much of social media around us which is visual i think this is perhaps the best time to be a cartoonist wouldn't you agree uh, undoubtedly from my perspective yes certainly <laughs> I think um so comics journalism really started in the 90s in the United States with a guy called Joe Sacco who published graphic novels where he was covering um issues in uh conflict zones so like in the in the Middle East um and in, Bo in Bosnia um but it wasn't until uh the I guess web 2.0 um and that sort of thing like 10 15 years ago when you started to see more of the type of work that I do which is like episodic um uh longer form like non-fiction comics um and that's really a quite established in parts of the western world and certainly in europe um i mean france long before the united states was getting on board like france was publishing like entire newspapers that were that were like in that sort of non-fiction comic style mm -hmm. um but um you know i mean in 2018 the new york times won the pulitzer prize for editorial cartooning with a long form non-fiction serialized comic about immigration um mm -hmm. so that style of uh, investigating stories or like looking into issues with a comic that is um designed specifically for the web and designed to be um uh, read in a um you know like either in a like a serialized fashion or like in a shorter style um i'd say that's like this is definitely the heyday of that you know you, you see those these sorts of works being published all over the world i mean al jazeera puts out comic stories like this as well you know um but the uh the type of work that i do at the nib so i work mostly for a publication called the nib which is a an american publication that does a com combination of work so we do like um the shorter political cartoons um uh like like manjul but that we also do like the the longer form stuff um and we use that i think uh to try and delve deeper into stories that could use more visuals or use more visual storytelling um and i usually tell people that the benefit of this is like you can add like an emotional undertone with art that is hard to get i think in other mediums 
and mm. you can also add like information um, in a um, in a way that's really homogenous. It doesn't take people out of the story, you know. So you can throw in diagrams, and you can throw in gifts, and you can throw in you know information in a way that is not like uh, you know in television. I actually have a background in broadcast journalism, um, and in TV, you know, you'll like have a talking head in video, and then you'll flick to an animated sequence, and you're taking people out of it. It's jarring to change that like to that change that visual yes. tone. Um, whereas in a comic, it's just flows. It's just staying the same. And I think that, that you can kind of keep people's attention and explain a lot of really complicated stuff, you know, especially with science um, in the age of COVID. I mean, I think comics have been really invaluable um, for in disseminating information about how is this virus working? What are the things that we can do? How do the mutations work? That sort of thing. Yeah. Interesting. And, and I want to ask Sumit and Rajita this. Um, uh, starting with you, Sumit, who is your audience and who are you talking to and who is actually listening? I'm very curious to know that. You know, big part of uh, my own work is beyond the political. It's just plain absurd comics, right? So uh, in that space, uh, you know, uh, uh, anybody who's uh, has as low an IQ as me is the audience. But so 20 is my okay. IQ. So uh, <laughs> when it comes to my political comics and, uh, you know, comic journalism, uh, most of the comics I've done and like, uh, you know, just heard like, you know, comic journalism, what you, we do is we uh, encapsulate the whole subject in a story, right? And what my approach usually with comic journalism is to make the, uh, you know, issue not just readable for someone who is Rendra uh, Guha, but approachable for, you know, that muscular boy who goes to gym 20 hours a day and, you know, eats Malai momos in Malviya Nagar. <laughs> Not everybody would understand, but, you know, somebody who has nothing to do with political uh, history, all of that, but they find the joke and, you know, Simpsons like humor is so, uh, you know, uh, easy to read that they accidentally, without them even knowing, I've planted the whole history in their head. And next time they get into an argument with anybody, they actually have that backlog of history, which will come into play then without them even knowing it. Interesting. Uh, Rachita, with, you know, sanitary panels, you've, you've created a feminist web comic. What has been the response? Where do you see your audiences being? And uh, honestly, when I went through your, uh, your Instagram handle and I saw your content, I was essentially seeing here's content that I could put out without writing reams and reams. And, uh, you know, that's how simple it is. Uh, so, so you tell me, how, how has this journey been and who have you been able to reach out to through your cartoons? Yeah, so when I started out sanitary panels, uh, you know, there are very few voices. I mean, even when I started it out, even now, there are very few women voices, queer voices that exist in this space political cartooning aside, just polit politics in general, there are very few um, opinions that exist in the public sphere that queer people. So um, I wanted to sort of start doing that a little and make sure that it's accessible. So my aud target audience was always women and queer folks. And it was always young people um, who like to be on social media, who, who have who have an understanding of memes, have an understanding of the kind of humor that exists on the internet. Um, so that, that's always been my target audience. And the reception has been fantastic, um, especially with, with women. My, I love seeing my audience chart on Instagram and seeing that women are always more than men, even though it is uh, so political in nature. And it's, it's very interesting to see that a perspective from a woman um, resonates more with women. Like it's, it's obvious, right? When when a woman is making is, mm. is putting out a political opinion, it's just going to resonate with women more because we're not seeing that kind of perspective when when men talk about uh, politics. The the idea of um, you know j just there is a whole different lens that men have uh, that that don't cover how issues affect women, how issues are um, you know always revolve around women's rights in some in some form. So I think that's that's what I was trying to bring with sanitary panels that talk about politics through a women, woman's lens because that's rarely something you get to see um, in the public sphere. So uh, 
I want to ask Manjul this. Uh, you were talking about how, as a you know, cartoonist, you first make a cartoon and then think of the kind of ramifications that that cartoon might have. But given the ecosystem that you work in, the media landscape that you find yourself in, and the various pressures and censorship that comes with it, how do you do your work on a daily basis? How what what are the things that you're thinking of? What are the issues that you pick on? Are you thinking of the common man, or are you thinking of uh, uh, when you make your uh, cartoon? Who are you telling this to? Are you telling it to the system? for them uh, to understand uh, how the common man thinks or are you telling it to informing the common person when people when people hear the word cartoon they usually think as something funny they usually think of like uh, they are going to read something which make them smile okay mm. but when it comes to political cartooning or editorial cartoon it is not always like that okay so one thing is you beauty of the cartoon is that if there are lines if there are uh, lines and still you are allowed to work you can fi- always find a way to make your point that is the beauty of the cartoon okay that is the best thing about cartoon like you, what you cannot say in words you can say the same statement with the cartoon so that is the beauty of the cartoon that is why this government is more worried from the cartoon rather than opinion pieces okay so first thing is there the other thing which you said about ramification one thing one point you made earlier that uh, i think this is the best time for the any kind of artist suppose uh, if uh, this this kind of like if i imagine similar kind of situation i am in right now say 20 years ago there was no social media only only uh, your cartoon uh, can be published only by the renowned publications today you can publish your cartoon across social media you can ask people to crowd source crowd fund you okay so obviously this is this is very good time if if i look back say 20 years ago right now it's a it's very good time like i can simply ask people that i don't have money i want to do this if you want me to if you want to see me like doing this thing continue doing this thing please donate and i i'm surprised to see that recently after uh, after this controversy people donated for me. so how can i break that trust people shown in in my work hmm. so obviously whenever i draw i think about that trust okay wonderful um, uh, i'm getting a lot of questions so i want to also um, uh, give a chance to all the ones uh, viewers who are watching us just to tell them that they can put their questions on www.themediarumble.com/live in the comment section and you can ask any of our panelists any questions vivekanand has asked a question of all of all four of you and he asks how do you deal with the threat to your personal safety or in some of your cases criminal intimidation in posting such bold content against the establishment how do you get the courage to speak against the government how do you handle the threats uh, or do the threats always get magnified but do not really affect you in the offline world let's start with rachita um yeah uh, so in terms of trolling and abuse i generally like my rule is to just never engage in in with with trolls because that's what they want they just want to uh feel like they have your attention and that they've affected you so just never engage with them when it comes to more serious uh you know tangible threats uh, or or threats to your safe um or your freedoms uh, that's when it's always useful to have a lawyer at hand to try and uh, assess uh, the risk of the situation so i think that's that's what i go with um in terms of mental health i would just always say have a therapist <laughs> it's it's really useful when you are constantly um receiving yeah. non stop uh, vitriol in your dms uh elery i feel like i can't speak to this at all oh, uh, yeah 
totally different experience for me. Um, you know, we've definitely, the Nib definitely receives, uh, you know, communications from people who are not fans of our work, but I don't think that we've ever had the need to feel that we need to take this to another level or to take it seriously um, in, in that regard. It's just a totally different climate of working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Sumit, have you had uh, to face any kind of personal intimidation? Oh, uh, thing is like, uh, in my family, I think most people are either property dealers or advocates. So <laughs> I, I, I am usually like, if anybody comes for me, I think it's more a threat for them. So uh, that sort of solves my problem. But um, uh, other than that, you know, m what I have seen is I've got my fair share of threats and not as much because right, like I said, my work is not as reactive. So People who are fighting, you know, these stupid things on a daily basis, right? Who are putting out cartoons, making fun of illogical things like uh, Manchul and Racheta. Uh, and whatever I have received, what I've noticed is 95% of them are just fluff, right? So mm -hmm. nobody's going to, you know, carry on <laughs> with whatever they're threatening you with. But a threat is obviously a threat. And I don't have as much experience. But yeah, mostly I keep like char lati big ones. So I think yeah, like mostly I'm ready to just fight physically. <laughs> I, I must say that the questions that our viewers have asked are much better than the questions I have asked. So I want to go through most of them. And uh, uh, Manjul, uh, after you, uh, your answer, because you clearly have faced a lot of intimidation. <laughs> See, the thing is, I tried almost everything. Uh, I tried to uh like listen to them argue with them uh engaged them for a conversation for a very long period but that finally i decided that rachita's way is the right way actually when i like uh, a year ago i started walking there hmm. is no point there is no point wasting your energy on these people there is no point engaging them okay they are not there to like for the sake of the conversation they are just they are just doing like they are there just to uh, bring you down not they are not ready willing to listen they they would always come up with such such kind of like third rate argument no there is no point uh, i i personally think that. Okay. and th there is another another thing which i feel that you would find that this kind of thing will happen on twitter more rather than on Facebook or on, uh, say, Instagram. The so hmm. reason which I think is that on Twitter, uh, I cannot delete a comment on my post. But on Facebook or on Instagram, I can delete people's comments on my post. So hmm. This extra power which they get on Twitter, they are basically misusing it. Okay, they they would they what they would do they would simply come and abuse you, mm. and for them it is a very normal thing. For you it could be like uh, worst thing which you have faced that day, but for them they they would go and uh, abuse like twenty other people. Okay, after abusing you, so there is no point engaging them. Interesting, uh, Ellery, For you from Dakshpuri, how do you aim to? strike a balance between art and craft in your work art being the message and story behind the work and craft being the aesthetics and technique which do you think is more important such good questions couldn't have thought of any of these i mean i think that uh when you're creating artwork for a particular audience we're always considering um you know the medium and i think that that really impacts the type of work that you produce i mean like where, um, so the publication I work for, The Nib, we produce a lot of magazines, so we also work in print, but we're thinking about how is this comic going to work online as well later on when it's published online. So there's those sorts of logistical and layout things really impact the way that you think about not just the art that you produce, but also the story structure and the way that you tell something, how much space you have. I'm sure that like even Sumit, when you're talking about doing like a really long thing, you still have a limitation on how much work you actually want to produce on something. Mm. And so there's a lot of that sort of flows from your initial planning process and the, the, the audience, the layout, the structure, what you have available to you. 
I, I've had the benefit for a number of years of having a lot of time to work on pieces. So working on a piece like Reported Missing, where I was able to use watercolors and uh, <coughs> everyone makes fun of me because I am the person who, I love patterns. I'm really into patterns. I'm really into like detailed, beautiful artwork. Um, but you can't make things like that all the time. Uh, you need to be able to uh, uh, work with some level of speed, particularly if you're working in print media and those sorts of things. Um, so that can like limit you. And I now primarily work in Procreate, which is an, 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 an application for an iPad. Um, and that, that sort of, so that impacts the artistry and the, the types of work that you're able to um, produce there as well, yeah. Uh, Rachita, to you from uh, Tapasvi Bhardwaj, power already knows the truth. Uh, they just don't want to hear it, so they suppress it. Ordinary people also know the truth and they also don't want to hear it. So they can't suppress it, so they simply ignore it. Is it still worth the risk to speak the truth to power through caricature? That's a fantastic question. I've been um, learning about cognitive linguistics and political messaging for a while. And I've learned that uh, when you tell someone that the news that they are consuming is fake, if it is fake, and you tell them it's fake, they're more likely to believe it more. So it's, it's interesting that people want to be told that they have made a mistake or that they are consuming something that is not so that, that's just a very interesting concept. But I think, yes, it is important to continue um, making, you know, it's, it's important to continue, continue dissenting, definitely, but it's important to continue making dissent to make sure that people know that it's, um, it's right to, it's normal to, there are other people doing it, that you should do it too, because we can't stop dissenting just because we're not able to convert the far right into believing what we believe in. Um, and there are also moderates and centrists who are still sitting on the fence and trying to pick a side um, or are going to do, you know, issue based uh, voting. So it, I think it's still it never ceases to be important to dissent. Um, and it becomes more and more important the more of a fascist government you have in power. So it's, it's definitely always needed. I agree with you and Tapasvi, yes, more and more people need to speak out, need to dissent and give their opinion. It's, uh, it's extremely important, but very good question. Um, uh, I'm going to ask this of Ellery and Daksh because it's not, uh, for, uh, it's not mentioned who it's for. Um, with the preferred medium for cartoonists act uh, actively changing to digital, do you miss the old physical mediums for the feel of it? Or do you prefer the digital mediums for the ease of it? Uh, Sumit, why don't you go first? Uh, you know, in my uh, sort of medium of comics, the biggest trouble, uh, particularly in our country, has been distribution. Because, you know, graphic novels are not, you know, sold as much and not everybody wants to distribute graphic novels. So what digital does for us is it solves the distribution problem. And uh, because if you like something, you just, there's no gatekeeper, you'll tag your friend. Mm. Second, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we particularly, I'm in love with web comics and uh, you know, I keep uh, saying to, obviously it affects people, but I keep saying that print is dead in terms of, uh, uh, you know, graphic novels in my, my space, right? That it's difficult to sell, it's difficult to make. So web comics, uh, you know, retain that sensibility of a graphic novel to some extent. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 that's why I think that's where internet is great. Where it slightly sort of misses a point is, uh, you know, the storytelling uh, length. Uh, because what happens is internet will reward your one panel things, right? Whatever can be contained in one panel or four panels. So usually, you know, people like us who make slightly longer things, we usually, you know, get handed down a slightly difficult landscape that we have to deal with, uh, you know, particularly the Instagram square. You know, that's particularly a villain in a longer uh, person <laughs> who makes a comic in their life. That's a villain. And also, you know, internet are rewards topicality, right? Now, our friends here are using topicality to good use. But there are idiots who also use it to just talk about whatever is happening that week, yeah. right? And which is not really political at times. So topicality is not, again, if you're not somebody who works within topicality or whatever is happening that week, then again, internet is slightly against you but i still feel it's great uh on the skill end though 
um, you know, when I started work, there was very little digital. So I learned how to use the crow quill, how to use India ink, all those things. So that helps me till today. Okay. Ellery? Well, I have this interesting situation where I started working for the Nib like seven or eight years ago. Um, and it was when it was launched by a new media platform called Medium. And we've since worked with another company called First Look Media. And now we're member supported. And our entire business model is on people buying print products. Like it's, it's, we have a bookshop on our website. We have um, a subscription basis for our magazines. And that is what pays my salary is people subscribing to that membership. Um, and it's weird because we got to that point by having a popular online presence, by ha by building a fan base on the internet. And mm -hmm. so it feels like it's this dual duality that's happened with the way that I work where, you know, I, I do have a lot of work in print now, but um, it's, it's a different format than I think that you would think of it in, in a traditional context. Like I'm not producing graphic novels. I'm producing things that are magazine length for a magazine or, um, <clears throat> you know, we're working in, in both of these fields. So you're designing a comic that can go in a print publication, but then can also be read in the Instagram square, you know, like you're trying to think how can this one piece of artwork have multiple applications that mm -hmm. both support people making the work, but also reach a really large audience. Um, and uh, so I, I don't see them in, in the, the area that I'm working in. I don't think that they are completely separated. Um, and in fact, maybe the, the world of crowdfunding where you have fans who want to buy stuff from you and people love, people love printed stuff, man. They like, we, the name is mostly yeah. an online publication, right? But we've like, we've printed calendars, we print books, we do anthologies and stuff like that. And that is a, a place that people are usually willing to put their money because people like buying a tangible object. They more so than just putting money into a, an online account for a person whose work they like. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, the questioner hasn't specified who this question is uh, directed towards. So I'm going to ask this of Manjul and Rachita. How do you feel when you look back at your early works? Do you get a feeling of satisfaction or do you feel like you could have done better? This is from Priyam. Manjul, please go ahead first. Well, I always feel I could have done better. Okay. And this is not about like the cartoon I did some 20 years ago. Even if I look at the cartoon which I did yesterday, I feel the same. <laughs> okay, okay. So you see, this is this is this is why you keep drawing, and uh, this is the reason actually why you keep drawing. And the other thing which you, you were talking about uh, about uh, see when I started there were no computers, especially in print media. Okay, uh, but. Uh, in 1997, uh, I started learning this thing because then they introduced computer and I was, uh, that time I was working with a very big publication and they were pioneers in everything. Okay. So, but in 2007, I decided to shift completely from uh, 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 traditional drawing to uh, digital drawing. Okay. This, why? Because this gives me more time. I can do, I can, I can communicate two more things to my readers. Okay. Mm. That's a time which it saves for me. So that part is very interesting, but I miss uh, that uh, because see, no matter how good your digital pad is or whatever, okay. Or what kind of effects you can put or when you draw on, on a paper or something, the kind of line you get there, the kind of texture you get there, there, there is no replacement for that. So you never get that feeling. The kind, suppose you are doing watercolor on paper and you are doing watercolor on digitally, you, they, they might look same, but the feeling will never be same. Okay, so I miss that feeling. But yeah, because see, I, I personally feel that I'm business of communication. So it helps me to communicate okay. more. I'm running out of uh, time completely. Rachita, quickly from you, an answer to this, and then I'll wrap up this. Yeah, definitely. So um, I don't think I can relate to everyone here because I make stick figures. 
Um, yeah. So there is there is not a lot of you know nostalgia about drawing on paper. <laughs> but I used to I used to draw on paper and take pictures and then upload them. And now I just do everything digitally, which is so much easier for me. It's so much more convenient because I did not know how to draw then. Um, so yeah, uh, but in terms of my humor and in terms of my writing, there has been a, a, a lot more development of the of my kind of humor about the finesse. Um, in my dialogue, but I still really love my uh, old work as well because it showed this kind of raw passion that I had for the issues that I would comment on. Okay, wonderful. And uh, I'm completely running out of time. Thank you so much, Ellery, Manjul, Sumit, uh, Rachita. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you for your time and more power to all of you.